this feeling that something was terribly wrong with the world that we live in, but you couldn't figure out just what it was. Then you've come to the right place. Secret societies, mystery religions, and the Illuminati have been controlling our reality since the beginning of time. But not anymore, because there is an awakening happening, and you are about to become a part of it. Lost and Found The book of Joshua states that the ancient city of Hazor was a royal Canaanite city and the site of Joshua's most important victory in the Israelites' conquest of the promised land. In Joshua chapter 11 and verses 1 to 15, it is recorded how Hazor's king Jabin organized a Canaanite coalition of kings against Joshua, but was defeated and the city was sacked. A century later, the Israelites are recorded as having done evil in the sight of the Lord, and, reading from Judges chapter 4, verse 2, And the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, that reigned in Hazor. Evidently, this was another Jabin, which was probably a dynastic name. In Judges chapter 4, starting at verse 4, we find the prophetess Deborah and Barak leading a revolt for freedom. In the battle of Tanak, Jabin's fortresses under Sisera were routed, and Sisera fled to the tent of Jael the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. Heber was one of the children of Hobad, the father-in-law of Moses, who had severed himself from the Kenites and had settled at Kedesh. Judges chapter 4 verse 18 and onwards tells how Jael invited Sisera into her tent and to fear not. He did so and asked for some water, saying, I am thirsty. Jael gave him some milk and covered him with a mantle. As soon as he sank exhausted into sleep, his very last sleep, Jael took an iron tent pin in one hand and a heavy mallet in the other, and with a single blow pierced the temples of the sleeping warrior. So died Sisera. Hazor is again mentioned in the first book of Kings, chapter 9, verse 15, as one of the Canaanite cities rebuilt as a royal administrative center by Solon. The last reference in the Bible to Hazor is found in the second book of Kings, chapter 15, verse 29, which relates how the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III conquered northern Israel, including Hazor, carrying Israel captive to Assyria. While the biblical records are the only source of information about Hazor from the time of Joshua onwards, we are fortunate to have abundant references in Egyptian and Mesopotamian inscriptions. The earliest historical mention of Hazor outside the Bible is found in two of the so-called Egyptian execration texts composed in the 12th Egyptian dynasty about the 19th or the beginning of the 18th centuries B.C. These texts are strange magical rites in which the Egyptians curse their actual or potential enemies. In one text, Hazor is mentioned among other potential enemies in Canaan. Our really valuable historical information concerning Hazor before the Israelite conquest comes from inscribed clay cuneiform tablets discovered in the excavation of the famous city of Mari on the banks of the river Euphrates. In the ruins of the king's palace was found the royal archives containing over 25,000 tablets and several listed shipments of tin to Hazor's ruler Idni Medad from Mari. Thus we are informed of the name of Hazor's king at that period, and that Mari was the source of the tin that Hazor imported for the making of bronze. One tablet from an official of the court informs the king of Mari that a group of messengers from Hazor had arrived. The tablet then reads, 
two messengers from Babylon, who have long since resided at Hazor, are crossing to Babylon. The next reference to Hazor comes from Egypt. Nearly every pharaoh of the new kingdom, that is, the 16th to the 13th centuries B.C., mentioned Hazor among the towns they had conquered in Canaan. Tutmos III, the famous pharaoh of the 15th century B.C., who captured Megiddo, mentions Hazor in this great battle. Hazor is again mentioned in the reign of Amenophis III, around 1400 B.C., and again in the days of Seti, around 1300 B.C. By far the most important reference to Hazor in the first half of the 14th century B.C. comes from the Tel El Amarna letters, a town in central Egypt. This is the private correspondence between Pharaoh Akhenaten, also called Amenophis IV, the heretical king, and the king of Hazor. They provide information about the Holy Land prior to the preceding conquest by Joshua. Most of the tablets are asking for help against foreign armies invading their lands. They name the Habiru and the Sagas, which would have been the Hebrews under Joshua. In one letter, the king of Hazor informs the pharaoh that he is safeguarding the cities of the pharaoh until the pharaoh arrives. But help never came at that time, and it appears that complete chaos reigned in Canaan. To the archaeologist, Hazor is unique. With an abundance of references to it in extra-biblical sources, covering a period from the 2nd millennium B.C. through the 1st century A.D. with only a few gaps and a geographical range that spans almost the entire Fertile Crescent, these extra-biblical sources might supply historical insight into Hazor's place in biblical events of the period. But where was Hazor? The historian Josephus gives us one clue. In his Antiquities book, 4, he wrote that Hazor lay over the lake Semachinitis, today Lake Hula, in Upper Galilee. Over the years, several tells or mounds have been suggested might be Hazor, but the first modern scholar who correctly suggested that Hazor was located on the site called by the Arabs Tel el Keda, was J. L. Porter in 1875. He described the mound as having a broad terrace with many cisterns, heaps of stone, prostrate columns, and other stone ruins scattered over the site. Porter's suggestion was not only not taken up by the scholars at that time, it was forgotten. It was not until 1926 that Professor Garstang, who was the Director of Antiquities of the British Mandatory Administration of Palestine, after doing some exploratory excavations on the mound, identified it as the long-lost city of Hazor. The mound occupied an ideal strategic situation in northern Galilee that fits all the known data concerning the site of Hazor. It was just north of the Sea of Galilee, and was below the southern tip of Lake Hula, as Josephus had written. It commanded a view of the Hula Valley, the source of the Jordan River, and the slopes ascending to the Golan Heights and Mount Hermon. It not only controlled a rich, well-watered agricultural hinterland, but stood guard over a vital trade and military route linking the Nile Valley with the urban centers of the Tigris and Euphrates valleys far to the northeast. In 1955, a team of archaeologists directed by Professor Yadin from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem began excavating the site of the Canaanite town of Hazor. The unique feature of the site was a large rectangular enclosure surrounded by an earthen rampart which was further defended by a very deep and wide moat. The area enclosed was about 200 acres, and the question arose, was it a camp area or a chariot parking place? And if so, 
why was it defended by such formidable earthworks which would have required the labor of thousands of workers for a long period? If not, could it have been a city? And if it was a city, then it was obviously the largest city in Palestine and among the largest in the Fertile Crescent. The population of a city is usually reckoned at 50,000 inhabitants per 1,000 square yards. This would give an estimate that the enclosure could hold between 30,000 and 40,000 people, making it an enormous city. By 1958, Yadin's workers had uncovered evidence of nearly continuous occupation of Hazor from 3000 B.C. to 350 B.C. That would be from the Early Bronze Age to the Persian period. The most spectacular finds came from the Middle and Later Bronze Age from 2000 B.C. to 1200 B.C. These included the Hyksos, Amarna, and post-Amarna periods, the last one showing evidence of sudden violent destruction undoubtedly by the Israelite conquest of Palestine. It was also ascertained that the huge earthen rampart did in fact surround a vast city, not one, but two cities, an upper and a lower city. Although Yadin's excavations covered only a tiny portion of the enormous mound, he uncovered architecture and other artifacts from the later periods of Hazor's history, which would have been during the reigns of the Israelite kings of the 10th and through the 8th centuries B.C. He also discovered the principal Canaanite palace, but failed to find the royal archives that would have included a record of events in Canaan immediately preceding the arrival of the Israelites. Another expedition to Hazor in 1990, sponsored by the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, in conjunction with Madrid University and the Israel Exploration Society, reopened the mound. The main objective was to find the royal archives that Yadin failed to locate. If found, it would have provided texts about Hazor's economy, politics, and foreign relations that would have provided information about the history and culture of Hazor that scholars can today only roughly reconstruct from pottery and other artifacts. Archives are a standard feature of palaces in the ancient Near East, and in time the one at Hazor is expected to be found. Cuneiform tablets have been uncovered, scattered over the surface and buried under the destruction debris because some are datable by language and style to the 18th century B.C., that is, the Middle Bronze Age, and others to the 14th century, the Late Bronze Age. It is believed that there may be two separate archives buried in the rubble at Hazor. The palace was found to form the heart of the upper city of Hazor. It was built to last. The massive walls of the core average 9 feet in width, and the eastern facade is almost 15 feet thick. Exceptionally solid stone foundations made of huge limestone blocks support the walls. It seemed that most of the residents lived in the lower city, but no stairway was found to enable the Hazorites living in the lower city to visit the palace or other administration buildings located on the Acropolis. However, the 1990 expedition to Hazor found the grand stairway connecting the two cities. It had been built over a large drainage system which led off rainwater from the city. Later, when digging deeper, a second set of stairs was excavated that had been constructed in an earlier period of Hazor's history. There is unmistakable evidence that the palace and the entire city of the late 14th or early 13th century B.C. was destroyed by fire. The conflagration not only demolished all the main structures of the city, but buried them in a three-foot layer of blackened ruins and ash. The heat from the fire was so intense in the palace, whose floors appear to have been of wood, the mud bricks of its walls were vitrified into glass, its basalt slabs cracked, and clay vessels in the palace melted. 
Adding to the intensity of the heat was the large quantity of oil contained in huge storage jars throughout the palace, creating an inferno with temperatures estimated to be over 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit. Within the confines of the palace, partly protected by the falling walls, were found various works of art, figurines, bronze swords, bronze armor scales, and a large basalt statue of a Canaanite god. Its surviving portion measured more than four feet from neck to feet. Other finds consisted of beads, cylinder seals, scores of Egyptian statues, and two spectacular bronze male statuettes, both about one foot tall. One of these was originally covered with a thin plating of gold, probably depicting the king. The figure wears a gown and a type of conical hat known from images on contemporaneous cylindrical seals. The other statue with its exquisite headgear, clothing, and sandals may represent a deity, a dignitary of the court, or perhaps a ruler. Both figurines had been deliberately buried in antiquity beneath the floor in two corners of the room, presumably to protect them from any desecration, or perhaps from invaders during the siege of the palace prior to its destruction by fire. The fires that destroyed Hazor were not just isolated fires, but appeared to have been set everywhere, and from the smashed storage jars and decapitated statues, it was evident that the city's destruction was the result of hostile action and not accidental fire. The question was, who was responsible? At first it was thought that it was a rival Canaanite city-state, but the suggestion was soon dismissed because of the apparent absence of nearby cities powerful enough to attack the well-fortified city of Hazor. If the destruction of Hazor took place in the early part of the 13th century B.C., the Egyptians could have been responsible. Pharaoh Seti had an inscription made describing his military campaign against Canaan around 1300 B.C., and claims to have destroyed Hazor. Another Egyptian, Ramses II, could have conquered the city on his way northward to invade Syria before the Battle of Kadesh in 1275 B.C., or on his return to Egypt afterwards. However, since both were Egyptians, it is unlikely that they would have intentionally mutilated statues of Egyptian kings. As would be expected in a city as large as Hazor, hundreds of homes, temples, workshops, and city stores were uncovered in the excavations of each stratum or period of occupation. Starting at the most recent ruins, the Persians, the Arabs, the city rebuilt by Solomon, the city destroyed by the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III, the Israelite period, and finally the pre-Israelite period of Canaanite Hazor, ancient Hazor, the largest and most extensive city, is not equaled by any of the succeeding occupations of the site. In the removal of the accumulation of the debris and the floors of one period, the archaeologists discovered that many of the walls of the lower and earlier stratum were tilted as if shaken by a very strong earth tremor. Many of the floors of the homes were covered by fragments of the ceiling that had fallen on them. Identification of the pottery found in the debris of the homes as being 8th century B.C. enabled the biblical archaeologists to date the earthquake as the one mentioned in the opening lines of the book of Amos, which reads, The words of Amos, who was among the herdsmen of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah, and in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. This earthquake must have been a catastrophe that left its mark upon the entire period, because it was used by Amos to reckon the years. Since Jeroboam II reigned in Israel between 789 and 748 B.C., and was basically contemporary to that of Uzziah, king of Judah, 
who reigned between 785 and 733 B.C., it enabled the archaeologists to date the destruction of the stratum to within a few years earlier than the one above. Judging by the standard of its buildings, during the time of Jeroboam II, the city of Hazor enjoyed an era of prosperity, as did the whole of Israel during the long reign of this great king. The buildings are among the finest of the entire Israelitish period. One home deserves special mention. It was first noticed by the archaeologists by the tops of stone pillars protruding from the ground. These were soon found to be tilted as a result of the earthquake previously mentioned. When excavated, the house itself was found to consist of a large court with a series of rooms on two sides. The eastern part of the court was covered by a roof supported by six well-dressed square stone pillars, three of which were still found in situ. The entrance to the house was from the south. Through its court where one proceeded into the rooms, two large ones in the north and three smaller ones in the west. Of particular interest was a small room on the western side which had no entrance but yielded an abundance of vessels, including many storage jars. It must have been a storehouse, and access to it may have been from a higher level not preserved. A house with a corner court, as found here, is typical of many Israelite residential structures and is known as a cornered court pillared house. Its plan and location, right in the heart of the city, would indicate the home of one of the wealthier citizens or an important official. With pillars and walls found askance, and the floors littered with hundreds of pieces of ceiling plaster, it was self-evident it was destroyed by a major earthquake. There was evidence that the residents had just eaten their last supper before the quake, which meal consisted, among other things, of olives, as indicated by the many olive stones found on the floor. An archaeological team digging in room number 6225 in an adjoining court, the number 6225 gives a little indication of the number of rooms found in this stratum, came across a little clay mask, quite intact having just uncovered a double-walled platform believed to have been a cultic altar, they thought they had found another temple. However, some additional digging uncovered a pair of potter's wheels, upper and lower, made of basalt, suggesting it was a potter's workshop. This was later confirmed by the finding of additional wheels and fragments of much-worn shards used in rubbing and finishing the surfaces of the earthenware. There were also adjoining rooms of pottery. Later in the general vicinity were found additional clay masks, and there was much speculation as to their purpose. They had first been made as a bowl, then the eye holes were cut out, the long eyebrows joined to the upper end of a straight slender nose which lacked any nostrils. The mouth was then given shape and the ears molded. Two holes were perforated at the upper end, and two more on each side, one above and one below the ear. These were obviously for threading a string to attach the mask to the head of the wearer or to another object. The masks were rather small, too small to be worn by an adult, but they could have been attached to a deceased infant or served some other function in the cult of the temple. One major objective is to locate the water supply of a city. It is the lifeline, so to speak, of a city, especially in times of siege. With the major city of Megiddo in mind, the archaeologists looked for a similar water system. In fact, every Israelite city had some sort of underground installation like King Hezekiah's famous tunnel in the city of Jerusalem. A well-fortified city such as Hazor certainly would have had a sophisticated system of water supply. A logical assumption is that there should be a vertical shaft inside the city ending in a tunnel that led to an external water source. There were and still are several natural springs on the southern edge of the upper mound. 
There was a deep ravine covered with green shrubs all year round, and it was there that the archaeologists decided to dig. The spot chosen was a shallow depression that could not be explained by any visible structural remains. After finding considerable quantities of late artifacts, including Persian, Hellenistic, Byzantine, and Arab pottery, the diggers were convinced that they had found the shaft arising upward to the Canaanite city of Hazor that had become clogged with debris and had been abandoned to become a refuse hole for later occupations. Digging by hand would have taken years to excavate the area, so a huge crane with two iron claws was brought in and work progressed quickly. After several weeks' work, a shaft began to show through at various sides of the dig, and even more importantly, broad steps were exposed that had been cut out of the side for easy descent. As they continued digging, the shaft became too narrow to allow for stairs. Before giving up finding the water system, a small tunnel that seemed not to lead southward where the springs were but westward was then investigated. Opening up this tunnel revealed that it sloped westward, but turned toward the south, finally arriving at a pool of pure water. It appeared that the original engineers knew, or at least suspected, that the water table which fed the springs outside the city also existed within the city walls, and was even better protected than the one at Megiddo, which was outside the city and subject to discovery by an enemy force coming against the city. To summarize, the archaeological evidence points to a huge Canaanite city with a population numbering in the thousands coming to an abrupt end in the second half of the 13th century BC and was never rebuilt to the extent that existed prior to the fire. The striking similarity between the size of the city as revealed by the excavation of only a fraction of the area of the site and the description in the Bible of Hazor as the head of all those kingdoms and having been burnt by fire leaves little doubt but that we have actually found the long-lost Canaanite city of Jabin that was destroyed by fire. Enjoyed this study in biblical antiquities, covering archaeological research in the Bible lands that has led to a proper understanding of the biblical text and historical events it records.